Welcome to the Smart Tech Check Podcast, hosted by Mark Vina, your home for candid, insightful, and provocative conversations about the smart home, home automation, security, smartphones, PC and console gaming, and much more. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Vina, host of the Smart Tech Check Podcast. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. Joining me for today's podcast is the dynamic duo of tech journalism. That's Stuart Walpin, who scribes for Popular Mechanics, U.S. News, Techlicious, Investopedia, and other fine publications. John Quain, who writes for the New York Times, Smart Cities, and Tom's Guide. Rob Pegarero, who writes frequently, frequently on tech policy for Wirecutter, PC Magazine, and USA Today, is at a conference. But I've got my two best boys, my two best friends. <laughs> I've got to say something nice. How are you guys doing? Good. Oh, Very good. Much. John, were you, were you racing around earlier? Um, I know you were sweaty. Uh, not that I want to introduce your public, you know, your private life to the podcast audience, but uh, we uh, no, I'm running along the East River. Uh, yeah. Watching the tugboats go by. <laughs> uh, how's the weather in New York? Is it hot and humid like it normally is? It has, it's, uh, uh, it's not hot. It's not hot. It is humid. A little sticky out there, but it's... Uh, it's threatening to rain. It's just been very cloudy the last couple of days. So hoping right. it gets well, better. Well, we're, we're getting in that time of year where New York is still pretty nice. You know, it's when you get into July, August, it's, that's when it becomes a bit. And then you go on the subway system. That's always a delightful thing to do um, <laughs> in July. And now you have to contend with whether you're going to get pushed on the tracks or not. But that, that's a different discussion. Stuart, how are you? How's, the, uh, how's my favorite Met fan doing? Uh, not so well. Uh, they've lost two to Houston, and I'm waiting for all the injured reinforcements to get back, such as the two top pitchers potentially in baseball to get back and uh, hopefully um, undergird our efforts for the rest of the season. <laughs> well, I, again, I could go on and on about my favorite team. Yankees, and, yes. uh, and did you see that home run last night that uh, Judge hit? I mean, he hit it over the catwalk. And yes, I, I I didn't see it. I heard about it. He's right. having it. He's having an MVP year, which is appropriate considering this is his. It's his walk year, or it, I mean, the Yankees are going to have to open up a very large bank vault yes. after this season to keep him. Yes, yes. Uh, his, you know, it's funny. I re- you know they offer him a pretty nice chunk of change. At the beginning of the season, I thought he was crazy from walking away from it. But his agent, I mean, everything comes together. Sometimes, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. I yep. mean, his agent is a genius because he's going to look like, hey, I told you, you know, yep. just hold him out and see what he's happens. He's having one of those historic seasons like Hank Greenberg when he had 100 RBIs before the All-Star break and yep. didn't make the All-Star team. And Reggie Jackson, I think, in 71, who had like 45 home runs by the All-Star break. So he's having one of those historic seasons. The question is, of course, whether or not he'll maintain that in the second half. But that's totally off our usual topics. I know, but we can talk about <laughs> baseball for a but let, let's get into some interesting topics here because we do have a few up here. Uh, this Google Lambda issue, which stands for Language Model for Dialogue Applications, you know, or better, why you know, describes this notion of a sentiment. You know, you know what's interesting about this, John. I want you to go into this first, and then we'll we'll, we'll go to Stuart, the Google engineer who was involved with this, who now has been put on administrative leave was on Tucker Carlson last night, which I thought was kind of an interesting place for a Google engineer or an ex-Google engineer to start. But should we be concerned about this? Let me go into a little bit about it. And then, you know, I guess the big issue is, is, is this, you know, is this the Terminator now actually coming into into vogue? Is this, is this, a, is this a, a possibility that we're going to all have to face? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting, the reason I raise it, it's just a very interesting question. I don't think it's something that we need to worry about at the moment, you know, immediately. Something that we talk about a lot in bioethics and, and other areas, because at some point in the future, um, some of these issues are going to be raised. And some of the, you know, there's one that dystopian science fiction thing, like, like they're going to take over and kill all and, and or it'll be like the Matrix and we'll all be floating and little vats, which philosophers talk a lot about brains of vats, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, what might be much more uh, uh, more interesting or realistic concern is suppose that these computing uh, you know, beings are become sentient. They seem to think and they seem to have some kind of consciousness. Um, 
how should we treat them? You know, what kind of rights would they have? Right, sure. Have any rights? Um, and, you know, would they be subject to the kinds of laws and regulations and things that all the human beings are subject to? And all these weird sort of strange questions start to come up. But at the moment, you know, really, um, this is much more people are familiar with the Turing test. I think this engineer was um, in what they call the Eliza effect, which is, you know, you yeah. sort of get tricked into believing after you're having endless conversations with this program that it does kind of seem like it likes the same bands that you like, you know, and it seems to have some philosophical answers to some questions or, you know, and, and you kind of get, you anthropomorphize this program because technically, you know, the mechanics of it are, no, it's not thinking, no, it's not conscious and no, it doesn't know that it's talking to a human. Like, just like Watson and Deep Blue and all these, they don't know they're playing chess. Right. You know, that's, that's a pretty big difference. Um, they don't know they're playing Jeopardy. You know, um, they but they are able to answer certain questions. So it's interesting, though, that, you know, that this engineer worried so much about it. And he went to the top people. He, he took it upstairs, yeah. You know? and, and, um, and so I think it is something to think about in the future. And, and you know, we need to think about how we're going to approach it when that that day does come. But I don't think that day is here yet. But but Stuart, let me get your reaction to something that John just said, and that is, is is the if you perceive on your end, on the human end, receive you know on the, uh, the receiving end of this engagement with with a sentiment, and you feel that the re the reactions are human like, have emotion, the fact that the device itself doesn't have emotions, it, it's almost besides the point. I mean, the definition is is that if you perceive it to be because the algorithms are so fast, they're so comprehensive, they anticipate um, emotions to John's point if they're programmed properly and they know what your likes, your dislikes are, and they weave that into its dialogue with you, that convinces you that it may have some type of conscious. So is that really the, should that be the definition, how good it is at convincing you that it does have these kind of uh, lifelike um, ca um, uh, ca uh, capabilities? And I'll go into one other thing. That John said, you know, animals, even though our animals don't have constitutional rights, we live in a country where animals do have certain rights. You can't treat an animal cruelly, you know, or there is some type of repercussion with it. So it's not like it's, that's without precedent, that something that is not human doesn't necessarily doesn't have a right. You know, so what's your reaction to all of this? Well, for, on a pure technological level. Without getting in, you have opened so many philosophical cans of worms <laughs> that have been around for you, for you, for you, since Stuart. a card in the early 17th century. I think, therefore, I am. And even he posed the problem of automata that could react as a human. From a pure technological point of view, these kinds of advancements always are a double-edged sword. All technology, throughout technology history, has always been a, a good versus evil, a, a, a risk-benefit analysis sort of thing. There's a great scene that I love. Technology, let's look at this from a pure technological point of view, outside of the philosophical point of view, which goes all the way back to Descartes. And I think, therefore, I am. Descartes, even in the early 17th century, talked about automata and whether or not it would be indistinguishable from humans if, if the technology got that far. This is 400 years ago. But technology throughout its history has always been a double-edged sword. Um, one of my favorite scenes is from the movie or the play Inherit the Wind, where the Clarence Darrow character played by Spencer Tracy is talking essentially to the jury and talks about progress as something that you have to pay for. You may have the telephone, but you will lose the charm of distance. You may conquer the air, but the clouds will smell of gasoline. So there has always been this pro and con whenever you move forward. There's always been a price that had to be paid. Um, when you have some new technology and suffered the unintended consequences of it. So where this case is concerned, the Turing test, the Turing test was strictly text-based. It was The Turing test was only, it, it's not the way that it appears in Blade Runner, where you have an inter, uh, a human interlocutor with a single other being trying to determine if it's human. The, the Turing test is a three- Part test where you have a, a male, a, a male, a female, and a judge of either gender, and they communicate only via text. What Lambda technology is 
is vocal communication. So you're adding in that extra layer of inflection, which lends an even more human part to it. This is not necessarily a new problem, of course. Back in, I think it was 2007, there was a, a chat bot um, called like Cyber Lover or something like that that would steal your identity by acting as a real human on these dating sites to get information out of you. So this is sort of the downside of this technology is that like deep fakes, it can be used for illicit purposes to make you think that you're talking to a human in addition to the positive things of communicating. For instance, anytime you go on a chat or customer service, how often do we get the customer service chat boxes where it says, I'm not human, but I can answer any real human question. And they can't, you know, you're just typing in human, human. Um, so it's, it's good on that side. There's going to be evil on the other side. I think Google has, has expressed itself in such a way that it is aware of the dangers of this technology. And while they're not building in Isaac Asimov's three rules of robotics, they are being very, very conscious of building in whatever safety that they can build into it so it cannot be used for nefarious purposes. But, but, but to John's point, you know, I mean, the, quite, the fact that this got kicked up the management chain and still hasn't gotten resolved. That's why this guy apparently is not working there. He's on administrative leave. You know, that, that's the kiss of death when you get when you when your employer tells you that. But the the question, uh, John, and then we'll we'll hit the next topic here is that the fact that it got kicked up and then hey, we don't really have a, we don't really know what we're, how to really position this within the company, position it externally. Does that say something about Google's management team that they're spending a lot of focus engineering wise to develop this capability yet? They're not kind of prepared to how, to how to utilize it, you know, and how to, and that to me scares the hell out of me, frankly, that they haven't been that thoughtful about what you know, we're creating something that could you know, may have a tremendous change with the way we engage with technology, yet we haven't really thought it through in terms of what the repercussions and the implications might be. Right. The, the assumption is that we're far, far away from anything like this happening. And so, um, you know, but what is of interest to me is most of the philosophical literature and the scientific literature is about assuming that these computers could think like us, hence the sort of artificial intelligence idea. But, you know, they're not designed anything, even though we call them neural networks, they don't look anything like what the brain's networks look like. Um, mm -hmm. However, suppose they do get a reach a level of complexity where we do kind of think they are thinking or feeling, even if we don't think they're conscious and we don't think they're like human thought. How do we treat them? That's the sort of thing. There could be this intelligence. It's not human intelligence, but it's something else. And um, and some philosophers distinguish between, well, they're emotional, but not conscious yet. And some are conscious, but not emotional. And um, the other, my other favorite, just one related thing was uh, here in New York, where Happy the Elephant in the Bronx Zoo, they've been trying to free Happy the Elephant in the Bronx for about two years, uh, basically in a habeas corpus kind of argument that, look, you've got him incarcerated, he's confined, and um, he's clearly an intelligent being. Does he qualify as being a person? Maybe, you know, so... Uh, they tried to get him out of the Bronx Zoo. They failed, unfortunately. Um, you yeah. know, they were going to move him into like a savanna, big. They weren't just going to let him free, but um, in, a, in a much larger thing. But they they failed. But um, it, it, it's these are questions that are going to continue to come up for us, and especially in the technology side. And you're right, uh, Mark. You know, it sounds like they should be a little bit more prepared in case you know you don't want to be surprised. <laughs> suddenly, you know. Now well, one, 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 one other thing I want to add to that is that in the history of technology, it has been a through line through all major technological development that the engineers are only thinking if they can do it. They very, very rarely think about if they should do it. And this has been a through line through in the entire history of technological development going all the way back to fire. There, the, the, the can and the should have always been very disparate lines of thought in, in technological development. So it, it's not surprising at all 
that not you will, may or may not be paying attention more attention to the should than the than the can than the I, I, I agree with you, but I'm just going to weigh in one final thought on that though. This is not cavemen two million years ago who hey they hack they happened to discover what fire is and you know they didn't really, <laughs> I'm not they, even talking about that. I'm talking about things like dynamite and airplanes that are used for bombing. Orville Wright completely disowned the invention of the airplane because it was no, no. used as a weapon of war. So it's not just fire. No, I'm no, talking about no, everything. No, 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 I got that. I was I was just making an exaggerated point to express the fact that Google has a board of directors. They have a senior management people. They're paid. To, to understand what the implications of, their, of what they're re re wreaking on society. And I get what you're saying, and I agree with it, but that doesn't take them off the hook. That's all I I'm saying. I don't think that's, what they're, that's not what they're paid for. They're paid to make money. And if they think that th this technology will make money for them, despite its nefarious po potential, they're going to discount that and lean towards the making of the money. That's yeah, always, just, again, that's always just the line. That. These big they just need to hire me. They just need a bioethicist. <laughs> and and uh, I'll look after, I'll, I'll think about those problems for them. <laughs> All right, let's, on that happy note, let's go to the next topic here. Uh, there we go. Uh, Stuart, this is in your wheelhouse because, you know, with, with all the talk about inflation, oh, yeah. gasoline, you know, yeah. there's this, I think it's this broad assumption that, hey, inflation can be out of control. It doesn't have some type of impact on the sales of, of um, in, your, in, your, in your space, you know, consumer electronic products. So you've done actually some work on this and we'd love to get your perspective because does that mean there's gonna be lots of deals later this summer? Um, I suspect there will be, but give me your perspective on whether the good times are gonna keep on rolling despite the fact that inflation is continuing to uh, crush Americans. <laughs> well, there is, I, I have been in communication with a, a lot of the major manufacturers and retail buying group organizations. So I've gotten input from Samsung and LG and Sony and TCL, um, as well as CTA. There is a guarded optimism. And one of, again, talking about through lines, the consumer technology industry has, is sort of, I don't say completely unique, but it is sort of unique in amongst industries is that it it weathers these economic storms far better than a lot of others do. Um, and, a, and a lot of that has to do with a lot of the product products being premium priced and therefore appeal to a, a higher, a well more he, well healed consumer than some other things. And I think also a lot of consumers consider these products to be necessities um, as opposed to luxury items, whereas you see the, the um, luxury cars or boat sales going down, you really don't see that if you look throughout the history of, of expensive consumer electronics items. So a lot of these TV makers, for instance, believe that there will still be a growing market for, say, 8K TVs, because those appeal to consumers who will not be as impacted as greatly um, as... Um, as uh, as lower end consumers might be. And the fact that 4K TVs are so inexpensive on the other hand, so their sales may not be heavily impact because if consumers aren't going anywhere, they're staying home. So there is some guarded optimism within the industry that sales may be down a little, but certainly not as much as the level of inflation would seem to indicate. Now, whether or not they're being overly optimis optimistic cautiously optimistic. I don't know that we'll see be seeing necessarily, but I think a lot of what I think the summer will give us an indication of how the fall is going to be in terms of sales, whether or not there have already been reports that people are going on car vacations, even with the price of gas. So whether or not that will have an impact. Um, there's also the, the sort of inside baseball stuff of how dealers price their products in the distribution channels um, and whether or not they have any real movement between MSRP and MAP pricing, that sort of thing. But what I found almost universally through everybody that I've, I've been in communication with on this topic is that there is cautious optimism that things will not be as bad in the consumer electronics industry as they are going to be elsewhere in the general economy. You know, you know, it's interesting. I'm in the process right now, which is why we delayed the podcast. So up, I'm upgrading the appliances in my kitchen and just re received a brand spanking new Samsung Wi-Fi enabled um, smart range. 
uh, because I haven't upgraded my stove in 15 years. So it was about time for me to do that. But what was interesting is that I was able to order it about two or three days ago and get it right away. Um, Unlike unlike a couple of months ago where, and you still hear about shortages of major appliances like dishwashers. um, I ordered one in September and still haven't gotten it. I finally just canceled the order. Right now, it also vary. It also is always going to vary from model to model and brand to brand. But the question I have for you is, I was able to actually get a deal. It's a top flight, you know, a pants. It's 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 a three thousand um, dollar, and I was there, and they were promoting it. They were they not, you know, at least Best Buy well, was. And- that may be that may be a time frame thing because you know as well as I do that this is the kind of season where retailers are swapping out last year's models. For this I, year's models so i don't know what mo- obviously i don't know what model you got but you may have gotten a model that they were simply trying to get rid of to try to make room for the new models that are coming in that will be the hot items in the late in the in the fall yeah so so, so would you advise uh, Stuart, given your uh, your experience and your your dialogue with the big uh, brand companies would you uh, advise people to wait till the end of the summer to see if there are more no. deals or no you, i think you- they should do exactly what you did because again, we're in that transition period. The new TVs are finally coming in, and and retailers, because of of the the downward sales of last year, they might have excess inventory. And I think that's what consumers should be looking for: is those excess inventories that both e-commerce and brick and mortar retailers are trying to clear their shelves of. And that's probably why there are going to be some very very good deals out there now. Those will likely disappear as we get into the fall season as those 2022 products begin to dominate the shelves. John, your thoughts on this, especially from the the, the um, perspective of, uh, you know, Apple is going to refresh all their smartphones, you know, in the September time frame as they normally do. Uh, you know, there's we talked about a week ago about the, um, the supply chain shortages that may affect not only Apple, but uh, Samsung as well. Do you really think that the inflation um, uh, piece is going to have an impact besides the issues that, that Stuart was talking about? Uh, it will have an impact on consumer demand. Do you really think that at some point these high prices on energy, the high prices on, on food, and et cetera, et cetera, you know, are people going to have to make real trade-offs be- between, hey, I buy a brand new smartphone or brand new um, refrigerator, or I can't, my family can't eat for the uh, next three months? I mean, wh- wh- where do you think this is all going to lead? It's going to be interesting, definitely. I think um, some of the supply chain issues seem to be easing for a lot of the manufacturers now. I mean, to, in talking to them, it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue for laptops and TVs and, and some of those goods that it really was before. So the supply should be there. Um, and I mean, in terms of I was looking at a lot of travel stuff recently, um, Stuart's right. You know, people seem to be insisting on it's damn the torpedoes. I don't care how much it's going to cost. They're going to travel between now and the end of August. After that is a big question because um, prices will still be high. And a lot of people have said, but I'm not going to travel after that. And already, if you look at prices that people are offering in the travel industry, they're offering deals that are less than half the price in September from August. So they they know this is going to happen. Will it happen with consumer electronics? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the inflationary pressures are not as severe on some of the things like TVs and laptops. And so um, those prices will probably remain steady. Um, but on the other hand, like everybody else, I've, I'm paying twice as much for my groceries. I'm paying twice as much for gas. Um, you know, they say, well, it's 10 or 15 percent, but it's really if you add up their bill, it looks more like twice as much. So that is definitely, you know, putting crap in my style. And so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see whether people yeah. think they have enough or want to run up their credit card a little bit for right. that new laptop. Um, that's a big question. Yeah. I mean, I, I know on, on the PC side, I haven't heard anything that uh, would I think it suggests largely what what Stuart talked about is that people are hoping, you know, they're being, you know, cautiously optimistic that it's not going to be a train wreck and, you know, we'll see the typical, you know, back to school, you know, response to um, uh, new PC sales. Now, interestingly, as you know, most people buy new PCs when Microsoft rolls out the latest version of, 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 of windows. I don't believe there's a major release 
um, during the summer. So there's not going to be that impetus to um, upgrade. But I'm not hearing anything that from any of the major um, PC guys that would suggest that they they believe Armageddon is going to happen later this year. They're all retooling their PCs, and we'll see you know brand new models later this year. So let's let's hope. You know, I do think again, I. You know, you, you know, you can't, you can't. You, well, as I like to tell people, you can't eat a new iPhone. You can't eat a new refrigerator. So, you know, who knows whether you know how people are going to react later this summer, and whether uh, you know whether they're going to be you know, betting on whether you know things will you know start to um, dissipate a bit. Let's get to our last topic, and that is, you know, it wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't talk about Twitter in some regards, and you know, it wouldn't be. Uh, and, and but the interesting thing is, you know, Twitter rolled out this new. It really is a blog feature for uh, called Notes. That's an interesting name. I wonder where they got that name from. Which yeah. is a blog capability, and of course, it blows up the um, that it, it, it's a little bit apples and oranges. It doesn't blow up the 280 character limitation, but it allows them to embed, you know, high quality, you know, um, highly uh, rich uh, content for a 250 word uh, limit, which is actually a pretty lengthy blog and i guess the question is is it going to be a good or bad thing i mean are people gonna you know well you know i, I sometimes i've expressed things in a 250 um 280 uh, character um uh, a cap that you know i didn't intend to say what i did knock knock donald trump god knows he probably wouldn't wouldn't use this feature anyway if if if, uh, if, if he was still on twitter but john let me get to you first is this going to be a good thing you know do you really think that th this will add a little bit of um Safety, not safety, but a bit more um, comfort to people to to, to um, extol on their views rather than get trapped by that limitation. I don't know. I don't think it's. I mean, you know, when they lifted the, uh, you remember when they initially lifted it for some of us? So suddenly, some of us, I could type in a longer Twitter because it was an official account or whatever they decided. Um, I, I don't know. It kind of breaks the original idea to me. Um, you know, was it Matt Damon in Austin whenever it was South by Southwest and this whole thing got introduced? The whole idea was just like blip and like a couple of words and a link or something. And so I suppose it makes it more flexible, but all these ideas, you know, that they have, I think, are just sort of uh, diluting the brand is what they used to say. Yeah. Um, and to me, it, it kills the function of it. It makes it less and less interesting and more and more like Facebook or more and more like WhatsApp or, you know, it's like, okay. Or Instagram right. rather so like, nah, I don't know. Um, I'm not going to spend extra time writing a much longer post. I mean, but it might allow me to take like the lead graph of something and put it on Twitter instead. But, yeah. um, and the other thing is most of us don't want to read, you know, that many words. We just want to take a glance. Well, that was that's the first of Twitter. Bad or good is that you had a 280 character limitation um, for that the top level message. And, you know, either you, um, you know, were judicious in the way you uh, sent a message. God knows there's a lot of people that, that did not exercise that type of caution. Uh, right. But um, I think you're right. I think the whole mission of Twitter was short, short uh, messages and the fact they're going to this almost kind of they're trying to add a blog dimension to Twitter. I don't know how that pans out. And what people will do for people like us who write on LinkedIn or Forbes or, or um, Medium or other blog platforms, all they'll do is they'll repurpose their content. They'll take that content. And I, I, don't think, I wouldn't write separately for a Twitter blog. I mean, it would be the same content. So I'm not sure what this affords people. Stuart, well, what, what, Oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add one more thing. I was just thinking the only person I've seen do more than, you know, the words that they were sort of allotted in Twitter is actually uh, a philosopher at NYU who's interested in AI. And it was about this discussion that we just had before. And he had to write one piece and then another piece and then, yeah. you know, link them all. And after a while, I was like, ah, I'm going to stop reading this now. <laughs> so, I know a lot of people do that. They do the one, two, three, four, five, and... I understand why they do it because they they, they want to make sure that their their their, uh, their continuous thread is not um, misunderstood in some way. Right. But you're right. I'm not sure most people, if you write a lengthy seven or eight um, uh, Twitter thread, that most people are going to read through the whole thing. Right. So, right. Stuart, your, what are your thoughts on is this going to is this going to address all of Twitter's problems? <laughs> well, by the, it, it, it's sort of to me paradoxical. It's at one it's at one point. 
uh, archaic. The idea of long form. I mean, John and I and you all know that 2,500 words, it's a lot of words. Most of what we write for media is 700 words, 1,000 words, 12 at the outside. 2,500 words is a lot of words. But on the other hand, this is a very natural progression in the whole idea that started with um, camcorders of the filters being removed from media for everyday people. It had been when we were young that in order to get anything published, and that means on the air, on the radio, and in, in, in print, you had to go through a filter. You had to go through a publisher. You had to go through a newspaper. You had, you know, it was a big deal to get your, you know, a letter to the editor in the in the local paper. Uh, to get on television, they used to have these community things where every once in a while you could squeeze yourself in there on a local television station. Um, but now with camcorders and now cell phones, you have a TV studio in your pocket with social media, with these blo- with these blog platforms, um, um, medium, which some people are calling tedium, which it goes back to the archaic part of this. This is all part of the natural progression of removing those filters from mainstream, from everyday people to allow everyday people to express themselves without anybody sitting on them saying, no, you can or you cannot. So whether or not it succeeds or not, I think is sort of beside the point. I think that Twitter almost had to do it to compete with the, with the sub stacks and and the, and the mediums of the world and the other blog posts, I think it was sort of you have to do it. You have to make it available so you don't you know fall behind. But I think it's all part of this very very natural transgression uh, transition at, as we move from moderated media to unmoderated media. And I think that a lot of social media is still grappling with that with Section 230 and a lot of that. So I think you're going to probably start to see all sorts of libel or slander issues because where do those 2,500 word pieces fit? Is it social media? Or if you say nasty things about somebody, is that something actionable? And I don't know whether or not just because it's being done by Twitter might shield them from that. And I think this simply raises the level of whether or not those, those legal filters are going to be applied. Yep. Well, I, I could see the advantage that if you're a Twitter um, user with a lot of followers, you know, 100,000, 200, 300,000 or more, you know, the, the, the big shots, I could see some, some added benefit for those users in terms of getting much more, um, you know, a thoughtful content out. Although I would say at the same time, the reason why those, um, those personalities have such large followers, they don't really, that, that kind of platform, that kind of capability with long form, doesn't necessarily. I can't see Kim Kardashian writing a twenty five hundred word <laughs> blog. No, no offense, but yeah, I just don't. See it, you know, but yeah, it's also you- it gives us an opportunity. Like you know, there is a rule of thumb online, which is you know, don't go past five hundred words. I mean, I don't care what the review is about. You know, it just people just don't go past the five hundred words, and so this may give us an opportunity to report on other people's tweets that are 2,500 words. And I'll write 250 words saying, here's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> so well, there may be yeah. this weird kind of infinite <laughs> regress of reporting. It's going to be interesting to see the way this plays out. I, I will probably give it a shot just to see if there's any, if I see any uh, uptick in, in Twitter responses. I, I, I suspect the answer will be no. Because you're right, John, you know, when you write a, th- a thousand words, typically it takes you five or six minutes to read. 2500, we're talking about, you know, 12, 12 minutes. I mean, that's a, a lifetime. Like a, a novel. But anyway, we'll see how that kind of pans out. Uh, guys, thanks for taking the time to join me for today's podcast. For our viewing and listening audience, thanks for making the Smart Tech Check podcast part of your day or commute. Please make, please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons at the end of today's podcast. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Mark Vina Tech Guy. And until next time, have a great week and thanks guys.